One of many things that I'll always be grateful to my parents for is developing in me a love of reading. And they did that for all three of us kids. That we made frequent trips to the library, I think once a week usually, and we're encouraged to read both fiction and nonfiction and, and to stretch and not just stay in the children's section, but go to the reference section and the adult section and read whatever it is that, that fulfilled our sparks of curiosity about different topics. We also had home many books and received a daily newspaper, which was a, a big part of my parents' morning ritual that they would read the paper over coffee and talk about what they were reading, what they were seeing in the newspaper. And as each of the kids grew older, we sort of incorporated ourselves into this ritual and were welcome to do so. So my brother, would, who's older, would pull out the sports section. And my sister, who's the middle child, would often get first dibs at the comics. And me, being the youngest, would have to wait for one of those. I literally had the classified sections if I wanted to read right away, but I learned in time these things. So I remember one time, being the third and last in line, I was reading the comics, and by this time, my brother and my sister had left the room. And my dad said, do you ever want to read the front section of the paper? And I was probably about eight or nine years old at the time, and I was like, well, sure, why not? And so he took the newspaper and, and opened it up to just the, the very front page. And he taught me how to read the front section of the newspaper, particularly the front page, that on the upper right-hand column would be the most important story of the day in the mind of the editors. And then below that would be, in many ways, the second most important, or maybe the most important local story. And then below the fold would be important stories of importance, but not necessarily those that would cause someone to buy a newspaper if they saw it on a rack. I realize I'm sort of taking people back in time with these images. But on the left-hand column of, this was the Los Angeles Times, there was what's titled to this day, column one. And each day, there would be a different story that wasn't really news, but was still current, and wasn't really breaking, but rather had some kind of deep insight. This column one was what my dad told me to think of as the think piece, because the think piece would be the one that would take a little longer to read, it would always be continued on later in the front section, and would cause anyone who read it with any attention to stop and think about the world in a whole different way. Now, this has stuck with me through 50 years, I realize now, so that even today, I'll look at the Los Angeles Times online for their column one story and allow it to take my imagination literally all over the world to different stories, different events, different people that column one will talk about. A few weeks ago, there was a fascinating story that really applies to the first reading this morning. It's the story of the Tongva language and culture in California. Not Tonga, but Tongva. I don't know if I'll say it that clearly the rest of the sermon, so please keep that in mind. It's one of 90 languages that when the Westerners first contacted the area we now call California, existed in that landmass. Now there are about 30 that are still spoken. Tonga is one of the 60 that no longer exists in a spoken form. Now, there's a woman named Pat Mur Murno, who is a linguist at University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And She's been a linguist really all her life, paid to do it for about 40 years now. When she was a kid, she just picked up foreign languages easily. Her parents were librarians of a very large library who had various international uh, clients and patrons, and she would just talk to them and start to pick up French and Russian and German. And therefore, as 
her academic career continued, she was drawn to the field of linguistics and had spent her life studying different languages until about the 90s when she started to focus. In the 1990s, she received two file boxes of slips of paper with words on those, on those pieces of paper and definitions. This was the remaining life work of two different researchers from the early 1900s in the Los Angeles area. And they were linguists themselves, and it's not clear whether or not they were even aware of each other's work, or perhaps they were in competition with each other. But simultaneously, they were collecting from the last people who spoke the Tongva language the vocabularies. And so there were in these boxes dozens and dozens and dozens of slips of paper with the word, with a phonetic uh, spelling of it, and a definition. Well, Dr. Murno was just taken with this. She said that the study of languages to her was like a puzzle. And here was the perfect puzzle. There were lots of pieces, but almost like no edge pieces. It was up to her to see how they interconnected. And she threw herself into this work and eventually became very well renowned for the study of the Tongva language. So go forward some years, and there's a major academic conference held in California to focus on the Native American languages that had been birthed in the now state of California. But this was a, a different kind of academic conference. It wasn't just for university professors and students. It was also for people whose heritage flowed out of those languages. They were invited specifically to attend the conference, to participate fully in it, and the conference was designed so there'd be lots of time for conversation and interaction with the people whose languages these were and the people who studied these languages. So Dr. Murno designed her presentations with that in mind and had lots of time for conversation and discussion and instruction. Because since she was working with a language that was no longer active, one of the things she's very careful to say is a language should never be called dead because then you're calling those people dead. No, instead it's an inactive language. As she presented on this, she found that most of the people in the room were in fact people of Tongva heritage. And none of them had ever heard the language spoken. None of them had seen a written word of it. It was, it was foreign to them, even though they knew that it had existed. But none of them had a great grandmother or anyone like that who had spoken it. It had been so long since this language had been heard out loud. And so Dr. Murno thought this was a fantastic opportunity and dove in with all of her puzzle-solving skills to say, this is how this word was said. How do you think we might say this word today, looking at this clue and that clue and this clue? And the people were interested and respectful and participating. But then near the last day, one of the participants said, there's something more we want. And the professor said, OK, what, what do you all want? And thinking she'd have like 20, 30 different responses. Instead, she got one from all the 20 or 30 Tongva people there. We want to be able to pray in Tongva. They didn't want to know how to sing happy birthday. They didn't want to know what was the national anthem of Tongva, if they've ever had one. Instead, they wanted to be able to pray in the language of their ancestors. And this blew away the professor. She said she suddenly saw language in a whole new way, that it was more than just the puzzle and intellectual enterprise that she had always enjoyed. But instead, she saw it as the very core identity of these people, even though they had literally never heard it spoken. They knew they wanted it. They knew it would enrich their spiritual lives. They longed for that connection with God through their deepest, deepest parts. And so she helped them. Together they worked and developed a prayer language in Tongva. And to this day, the, she continues to offer classes to the community, to anyone who wants to learn the Tongva language. But now she knows to make sure she has within it 
a component of prayer, that people can, in fact, pray in Tongva now, in words that had not been spoken for 60, 80 years in a spiritual manner. The Pentecost story we had from the book of Acts, of course, is about people hearing about the grace of God in their own languages. And what I think is fantastic is that from the story from UCLA, we know that people do have a longing to speak in their own language. But, of course, it, it's more than just what is the lingu linguistic structure of what we're saying. It's whether or not God is really hearing who we are deep down. That the Tongva people wanted to be able to speak from their deepest, deepest parts of themselves to God. And to do that, they needed the Tongva words. And we ourselves today, regardless of what our native tongue is, need to speak to God in a way that we know God is hearing us and seeing us and getting us. And of course, God does freely and generously. But unless we as human beings show that same appreciation and generosity of presence, then people won't believe that God's really hearing them. And I don't mean we all need to become bilingual. I'd love it if we did. I'd love it if I could be fully bilingual. Instead, we need to pay attention to people, listen to their words, listen to the, their vocabulary, and hear what is the world within their language, within their language, even though it's English. How is the world functioning? How is the world made up? What are the important nouns and verbs? And then we can help them see that God knows that language too, because God is already there and speaking with them. That's the miracle of Pentecost, not being multilingual, but listening and then being able to say that God hears that also, that God is hearing us in our native tongue. Now, one of the other things that my parents tell me about reading a newspaper is not to just read the stories that I'm immediately drawn to, but instead flip back through a newspaper, back and forth, after I think I've done reading it, and see what else is there. See what other stories that are there that didn't first pique my interest, but instead maybe challenge how I see the world, or disagree with my preconceptions, or are about something that I never even knew existed, and therefore broaden who I am, broaden my perspective, broaden my sense of the world. We as Christians are called to do the same thing. We can't go out and all learn another language, but we can continue to allow ourselves to be exposed to new ways of seeing how life works, listening to people's life experiences which are very different from our own, and therefore translating the gospel, translating the good news of God and Christ to people who may not know that God, in fact, is with them, that God is with them no matter how different their life is from a traditional Episcopal life, whatever that is, but instead God is always with us is always loving us, is always listening in whatever way we're speaking to God, even if it's words of frustration or anger, God is listening. And we are called to be instruments of response, to let people know that God speaks their language. God speaks every language because God loves everyone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.